Hey guys, before we begin this episode, I wanted to clarify something about what you're about to listen to. Originally, I had been a little overconfident in how far we were going to get in this single episode. Uh, so much so that I said we were going to get through parts 5, 6, 7, and 8. However, our part 5 portion of the episode was 45 minutes in itself. So uh, this is actually going to be two separate episodes so just kind of disregard when I get all excited at the beginning about how much we're going to listen to. That being said, let's get on to it and uh, see you on the next one. Stay tuned after for the next episode. Welcome back to Random Book Club Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Van. With me today again, my co-host, Donovan McMullen. How you doing, bro? Good. Doing great. Good to nice have you here. Warm weather outside, finally, for once. Yep. We got nice weather. But this won't be posted till winter, so... You know, whatever. We'll good, have the point, memories. good point. Good point. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's true. Anyway, we got a big one tonight, Don. Um, we're going through chapter one, parts five, six, seven, eight. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. How long? How long were we holding on to that one? <laughs> For a long time. <laughs> but it's it's a big one. We basically the parts five and six. I wanted to get that one done. That's going to be when Geralt's getting ready, and then Geralt goes to the actual crypt. But then part yep. seven and eight is like so um, short that you just kind of have to include it. So I just kind of figured. Surprisingly, yeah. So I, yeah, I remember that. It just, it kind of, you were excited because the buildup actually took way longer than the actual argument. Can yeah. I call it, let's call it that for now. Yeah, the actual like meat and potatoes of it. So, speaking of the meat yeah. and potatoes, let's just get right into it. Chapter 1, Part 5, Summary. Oh, well, before we go into the summary, of course I always do this. Uh, where we left off was King Foltest and Geralt were talking inside of Geralt's, like, wherever he's hanging out right now um, while he's waiting to do his job. And King Foltest had come in at, hidden as, like, a soldier and then with the miller and then finally him and Foltis were talking and he's like, okay, so you're doing the job. All right, cool. So here we go. Going into part five summary. Uh, the part starts off with Geralt inside the old palace. So we just zoom right into the old palace. Now we're, we're in the place where it's abandoned that had been abandoned for seven years earlier, looking uh, out one of the palace windows as dusk was falling rapidly. The view from his old, from this old castle verified what Geralt had learned about the effects that the Striga had made on uh, Vishima. He could see the lights of the town flickering in the distance, could see the wilderness which had grown around the old building due to the townspeople avoiding the area, and also the Witcher could see the stout tower of King Foltest's new palace looming black in the distance against the darkening blue sky. So that's the setting. That's where we're at. He's just looking out that palace window as the sun's setting. Geralt then heads into one of the empty chambers to continue his meticulous preparations he had already started, knowing he had plenty of time before the Striga came out at midnight. So here's, a, here's an excerpt from the book of, of this scene. On the table in front of him, he had a small chest with metal fittings. He opened it. Inside, packed tightly in compartments lined with dried grass, stood small vials of dark glass. The Witcher removed three. From the floor, he picked up an oblong packet thickly wrapped in sheepskin and fastened with a leather strap. He unwrapped it and pulled out a sword with an elaborate hilt in a black, shiny scabbard covered with rows of runic signs and symbols. He drew the blade, which lit up with a pure shine of mirror-like brightness. It was pure silver. Geralt whispered an incantation and drank one after the other, the contents of two vials, placing his left hand on the blade of the sword after each sip. Then wrapping himself tightly in his black coat, he sat down on the floor. There were no chairs in the in the chamber or in the rest of the palace. So he's getting he's getting prepped. Um in kind of a cool way. He's got yeah, this two Go two ahead. things I want to note is I like how I remember this. They didn't uh they didn't say how many vials he had, but that he took three. And I'm like super glad that they did that because the OCD in me would like be like, all right, there was 20. He has 17 remaining. And I would do that for the remainder of the books. Even if it, there was like time jumps and stuff, I wouldn't care that I would just count those vials for the rest of the time. So I'm glad that they went over that. But uh, 
this I wanted to add this before we got into too much when we're still talking about the prep. One of the things that I remember while reading this is that I felt as the reader we weren't as caught up as uh, Gerald was. I was actually a little worried for him going into this, yeah. and I couldn't tell if he was worried too. I couldn't tell if he was hiding it, right? So, like, we learned that he's getting slower. We learned that, you know, he's not as quick as he once was or as sharp as he once was. But then, like like you said, he's getting ready in a badass way, and we're like, all right, all right. I'm not too worried for you, but, like, I was still in a little bit of suspense. So the way that they are able to balance this basically – what are we going to call him? Just OP. Yeah. <laughs> OP needs to be nerfed. One punch man. So they're just running through the crypt and be like, I got this, whatever. I'm a witcher. And then they're like, Oh, he can just free shit with his mind. Okay. Then what are we even doing this for? Like I obviously the witcher, but it, it because like later on in the book too. And I'm I, again, a little bit of a spoiler. There are guards and, and we already ran into this. There are guards willing to fight this guy. Yep. Like humans willing to fight this guy. And, he, and we already know that he can, make his <laughs> he can make his blade shiny <laughs> like yep. is that what we thought yeah 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 okay so we already know that he actually has spells that people have seen and they're still like oh, i'll fight this freak right <laughs> like yep. it's not like he's superman nobody wants to fight superman as a human except for lex Luthor, but that's because he's got his own thing going on it's just i like how they make that like you're still worried about a guy that has abilities who's obviously not human, who's obviously better than being human. Cause every time he fights people, he just, he just spanks them, just spanks them. Yeah. And then when he fights monsters, it's fair and monsters kill humans all the time. So it's like, I, I don't know. It's just, I would imagine I wouldn't ever want to fight this guy. And then you're still kind of still worried for him. It's amazing how they're able to do that, how he's able to write that. Yeah. I like, I liked it too. The, the preparations are kind of like of two parts. Like you, like you were saying earlier, you don't really know if Geralt is prepared for this or not. You know, he, yeah. he's asking every single question he can to get ready, but you don't know if, like, is he going to be able to handle this? He always plays it so cool, so you don't know. You know he can dispatch three dudes, no problem, but they were in a bar, you know? And so now he's, like, actually got to go against the monster. So this is our first experience with him getting ready for that. When they start off with him, you know, seemingly taking a break from his preparations, looking out the window, <laughs> then he goes back to it and he's already began it. And he's got a chest, and this is the first time we've heard of this chest, and it's got a bunch of potions in it, but he only takes three, like you said. And so it's like, yeah. oh, okay, so there's probably more in there. And he's drinking it and, and preparing, saying incantations, and you're like, oh, this is really cool. He's getting himself, like, ready for this fight. Like, it's almost like studying for the fight or knowing exactly what he has to do. But then you think, oh, shit, if he has to actually prepare for this he probably knows shit's going to get real. So now you start to get worried again. Yeah, like, that's what it was. That's yeah. what it was. You were like, you were like, it's not that you were worried about him being slow. It, that's not what it was. It's not like, oh, I think he's going to be too slow to fight this guy. You know, it's not, it's not that. Know. Uh, watch out. Uh, it's and, and you really don't know too much about the monster. I know they described it pretty quickly, but like at this point, there's no first person description yet. Right. Like once once he sees it, then it gets a lot better. But it's one of those things where it's like, that's what it is. It's you see him prepping. You're like, oh, this is cool. Oh, but if he's already strong and he has to do stuff to make himself stronger, like, uh, hey, man, is it which or can he dog? Actually can't and talk the other it. aspect, too, the other aspect, too, is you don't know if he's going to kill it, cure it or a combination at this point either he's just prepping and you're like well he's not telling you what he's prepping or why it just says silver blade now i know from the video games that and the comic books and the no i'm just kidding um i know from the <laughs> from the video game that the silver blade was always the monster sword and then the the steel blade was for humans right and i also know that humans would kick your ass because i always had it on hard mode and i never had any good armor in that game because it took me 70 hours to beat like the first 300 missions on the very like first village you're all anyway, probably playing on hard i don't want to get into it yeah i don't i don't wanna, anyway um it, it's impressive to me that that like i said he can portray that we're still worried about this character that you know nothing about yeah. it's impressive it's impressive you know this guy can handle himself but you're still like oh no watch out mr Geralt. well it's so much build up because we're just ready to see him actually get into action and so 
it's like we're ready for it so let's but continue it's not- Let's continue. Every Let's other, on. but every other movie is like you're excited for him to fight, and you're like, "Yeah, this is gonna be an easy win. My guy's gonna kick your guy's butt." But like this one, you're not that way. It's weird. So, after he ingests two of the three potions, Geralt <laughs> sits motionless with his eyes closed. His breathing starts to pick up and becomes rasping, intense, but then stops completely, setting him in a state of complete control over his mind and body. Uh, with his uh, drastically sharpened senses, he hears footsteps in the courtyard. Geralt throws his sword across his back, hides his bundle in the hearth of the chamber of the ruined chimney, and runs down the stairs, silent as a bat. So here's what it says from the book. It was still light enough in the courtyard for the approaching man to see the witcher's face. The man, Ostrit, backed away abruptly, an involuntary grimace of terror and repulsion contorted his lips. The witcher smiled wryly. He knew exactly what he looked like. After drinking a mixture of Banewort, Monk's Hood, and Eyebright, the face takes on the color of chalk, and the pupils fill the entire iris. But the mixture enables one to see in the deepest darkness, and this is what Geralt wanted. So, Ostrich's freaking out because he sees what Geralt looks like. He's like, oh, witcher! <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, where'd you come from? And Geralt oh, was like, can you can you share that picture? Mm, yeah, oh, I, bet you, I, I bet you. I bet I bet I could. Let's now. see if we can. Yeah, that there's that picture from the is it from the Netflix series? It is. Oh, we just got demonetized. Oh, oh there goes all the free bucks. Oh, is, is it in? I don't gone. have I don't have access to it. Okay, that's fine. Just I don't do have it because I'm on, it's on my other account, but no big deal. Gotcha. So yeah, he looks. Uh, crazy, and I liked how they go into what the mixture of the potion was, and we'll we'll talk about that more later. But uh, we'll just get through the um, the review, and then we'll have some more in depth discussion when something really good comes up. So Ostrit right, the Magnate quickly regains control after being surprised by Garel, telling the Witcher that he looks like a corpse, probably from fear, but not to worry because he brings him some reprieve. The Witcher doesn't reply. Ostrit says, "Don't you hear what I say, you Rivian charlatan?" You're saved and rich. Then Ostrich pulls out a fat purse, telling the Witcher that it's a thousand orins. He tells him to take it, get on his horse, and get out of here. The Rivian still said nothing. At this point, Ostrich lets the cat out of the bag and angrily exposes the fact that he doesn't want the Witcher to break the spell, that he is not in league with Velarad and Seglin, and uh, that he doesn't want him to kill the Striga. Ostrich says that all the Witcher has to do is simply leave, and everything to stay as it is. With the night quickly getting darker, to Geralt's eyes, to Geralt's eyes' relief, he speaks slowly, controlling his every movement so that so as not to let Ostrit know of the potion's enhancements. Asking Ostrit why exactly he is to leave everything just as it is, the magnate proudly denies an answer. Uh, proud, proudly denies an answer, saying it should be. It should be of damn little concern to you. Detective G-Man then counters by asking, Detective and, G-Man. <laughs> and what if I already, right. He says, and what if I already know? You know, you say, it's none of my damn business, but what if I already know, bro? To which Ostrich invites him to go on, to which the richer obliges by laying all the cards on the table, exposing Ostrich's plan to dethrone the king. How it would be easier to remove Foltest from the throne with the threat of the Striga remaining. How the people will have had enough. Uh, Geralt also explains that he came to Vajima by way of Redania and Novigrad, which is all the way on the uh, western side of the map. Uh, okay. And uh, where Vizimir is king. The, remember that Vizimir, the guy that wanted his daughter to marry Foltest and Foltest didn't want right. it. So while he was there, he says, and while in part of that kingdom, he heard rumors that the people in Vajima looked to King Vizimir as their savior and true monarch. Geralt finishes uh, stating that he simply doesn't care about politics, that he is only there to do a job, and he questions Ostrich's sense of responsibility, honesty, and ethics. So basically what he's saying is, he's like, yo, I came here from all the way over in in the land of Redenia, where uh, Novigrad is, and the people there say that the people in this town think that <laughs> Vizimir is the rightful king. Okay, so if 
I, I see what your game is, dog, and you ain't playing crap on me, dog. So then Ostrich blows up at this, screaming at Geralt, basically yelling, careful to whom you speak, bitch. <laughs> Ostrich puts his hands on his sword and continues to rage at Geralt. I've had enough. Look at you, ethics, morality, from the guy who barely gets into town before murdering people, who bo who bows to King Foltest while making backstreet deals with Velorad, and you know, uh, and you turn your nose up to me, you surf? He calls him a surf. Oof. Ouch. Pretending to be a knowing one, a magician, you scheming witcher. Get the F out of here before I run you through with my blade. So Ostrich's pissed. Geralt didn't move, just stood calmly. Then told Lord Ostrit he'd better leave. It's growing dark. Oh, God, I love this part. Ostrit does not leave. He takes a step no. back, it draws dumb, dumb. his sword in a flash. Wow. And then this is, this is from the book. You asked for this, you sorcerer. I'll kill you. Your tricks won't help you. I carry a turtle stone. Geralt smiled. The reputation... <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a minute to just soak that in because I love, I love that he just smiles. The second I read that he smiles, I was like, this is dumb, dumb, this yeah. big dumb. The reputation of Turtlestone was as mistaken as it was popular, but the Witcher was not going to lose his strength on spells, much less expose his silver sword to contact with Ostrich's blade. He dived onto the whirling blade uh, and with the heel of his hand, and the silver studded cuff hit him in the temple. And that's the end of part five. Yeah, because he's super saiyan now. So, we got some points of discussion here. So, uh, when he takes his potions, it reminds me of kind of uh, like a werewolf transformation, where he forces himself to sit motionless with his eyes closed as the mixture begins to take effect, causing him uh, what seems to be a temporary loss of control. It, it seems almost... Uh, masochistic because his attitude and reactions to his surroundings goes from controlled to domineering. So what I'm saying there is while he's like always in control, he takes these potions and then he kind of has a transformation. His breath gets raspy and he, you know, he has to like basically calm down to allow himself to let it take effect. And then he gets control over it. And before mm -hmm. he's controlled, he's, he's always the smartest man in the room. But now that he's got under the, under the enhancements of these potions, he comes down to Ostrich. The first thing he does is he smiles at him. I'll, I'll look and I'll... He knows he looks freaky. Yeah. Ostrich talks some crap. He doesn't care. He just lets it happen. You know, Go ahead. So to me, to me, this sounds like hallucinate, hallucinations. Okay. Or hallucinogens. Um, so I shouldn't say hallucinations. It sounds like hallucinogens. So if, he, if basically he's somebody that can control it, it's almost like he's taking something that makes him lose control, right? Like something yeah. like a very strong hallucinogen. And then he's able to accept it. And then now he's got like special abilities. So I, it's almost like if you, if you go through the contents of what's in the potion, I think some of those are, or one of them possibly was, if I remember correctly. And that's what made me kind of think of that. Like it's, it's almost as though he's not, it's still him. It's still the same strength. It's still the same reflexes and stuff, but he's able to tap into it now. Yeah. It's like That's super the only difference. It's, it's like super girl kind of, or it's like catnip for a cat. That was the other thought I had. It's like catnip for a cat, which I still am on the table on if that's a hallucinogen or not, because my cat's eyes go real wide. And then I, I start looking like I'm a tasty snack. Yeah. Kitties get real excited for that catnip. Yeah, they do. Uh, the next point of discussion I want to bring up was the effects of the potion itself. After Geralt ingests two of his potions during his preparation for the night, we get some great details of some of the effects it has on him. In particular, in particular, uh, like the part when he intercepts the magnate ostrich in the courtyard. How Andre writes Geralt's perspective is it, it's showing um, kind of the effects through his his uh, writing here. So here's a, a part from the book. The Witcher did not move. He did not want the Magnate to realize how fast his movements and reactions now were. It was quickly growing dark, a relief, as even the semi-darkness of dusk was too bright for his dilated pupils. And why, sir, is everything to remain as it is? He asked. Oh, that was Geralt, so he's got to be gruffer. 
but you get the idea. He asked, trying to enunciate each word slowly. So that that's a detail of three parts. He didn't move because he's fast now, and the darkness is a relief to Geralt's now light-sensitive eyes, and he speaks slowly because if he spoke at what he thought was normal speed, it would be like listening to an audiobook at two times speed. <laughs> that would be awesome. And what Geralt is hiding huh? all of this from Ostrit because he doesn't want him to know the extent of his current state of heightened ability. What right. Geralt... Go ahead. It, it's... We, we already know, and I don't remember if it's from the book or not, but this is something that they do as kids to become a witcher is they have to drink this poison over and over and over again. So now they have an immunity to it, and that's also why it leads me to believe that it's like a hallucinogen. So they have an immunity to it. So like any normal person would drink that same potion and, and just, yeah. just be done. Yeah. Yeah. That was the idea. So not not only is he has he has three of these. He's taken three of them, man. That's he's only kinda, taken two of the three. He's only done two, but yeah, he has a third one to boot. We already know that that's his like Super Saiyan two potion. Yeah, who knows? So what Geralt is experiencing under the potion's effect is interesting enough, but him wanting to hide the effects to me is more interesting. It's almost like a trade secret or something. I wonder if the general public's view of Witcher. Uh, of a witcher would change if they knew of the performance enhancing drugs they take before they undertake a behest or a job. So I just think that's kind of interesting that even under that influence state, that enhanced state, he wants to hide it. It's almost like he wants to keep it secret. You know, I guess it's the witcher code, but like, it seems like it's something more. It goes two ways because he also doesn't want to waste any energy. He says not a yep. spell, not anything. So like literally he just had to do one duck roll and a bat to the chin and then knocks him out. Right. So I get that, but I, I agree. I there, I didn't think about that aspect of it. I always thought it was just kind of like he was just consuming all of his effort, all of his energy. The more effort he puts out, the quicker that wears off kind of shit. That's how, that's the rules of being a werewolf. Right. Yep. Can't kill people. Anybody. Nothing to do with the moon or anything. It's just like the more people you have to kill, the sooner it wears off, right? Um, so I that's what I took it as. But that actually, maybe he wanted to have that conversation just so that he could solidify what he already thought. You know what I mean? Because yeah. he already knew why he bother talking to the guy. Why not just knock him out? Yep. Just like, oh, thank God you're here. Now I can use you as bait. Ba bam, and then knock him out right away, and not even just even talk to him. Well, I like the, that he tries to bring a thousand ore into him, and it also explains why that original, the other Witcher that it came, Ostrich said, yeah, the the Witcher ended up leaving in the middle of the night. Must have got scared. And yep. in reality, no, dude just got a thousand ore in. And bounced. okay, so now let me ask you: the king offered three k, right? Yep. The original deal, and then I think the king tried to lowball him a couple times. Not like two thousand. No, he no what king he... did not lowball at all. It was, I think it was Velorad. Yeah, 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 yeah. Velorad when he was explaining, he's like, "Yeah, there's some people in town that might give you um, a thousand orin." And you know what? The first thing he says is a thousand orin, which is exactly what Ostrich's yeah. giving him. Yeah, so maybe he knows too. But <laughs> um, so. If he would have showed up with 5,000 Orin, do you think the Witcher would have still done it? I mean, he That's already prepared. He already prepared. He might try. I think, he'd, I think he'd knock the dude out and take his 5K and then go do it. Yeah. So, uh, places of note. Uh, map. Bring out the map. <laughs> All right, here we go. We got the Sorry, map here. No swiping. Wait, do we have to sing the map song? Nope. It's right oh, okay, here. good. So we've got Redania and Novigrad, um, right? I came here by way of Redania and Novigrad. There is much talk there that there are those in Vajima who look to King Vizimir as their savior and true monarch. Redania is the region just north of Temeria. So here's our map. It's, let's zoom in. So here's our uh, Mahakam mountain range again. And we've got um, Vajima right here. There's, there is that. Redenia, Tamaria is where King Foltest he rules, and he he rules uh, the Mahakam uh, mountainscapes, kind of in the middle of the map. Tamaria is on the west coast, just a just north of Tamaria is Redania, uh, and in Redania is this little castle, um, little castle coastline kingdom of Novigrad, and that's where 
um, our king Vizimir lives. So he can't. So the Witcher, even though he he comes from Rivia, he's a Rivian. You know, with those accents, those funny accents. The Kentucky of. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. This this in itself gives you an idea of like, okay, so here's Rivia. To get to to Vizima, all he'd have to do is go north around the Mahakam, or through the Mahakam, or south. But he says he came by way of Novigrad, which like kind of tells us he's been doing other jobs on the way here. You know what I mean? And then he's there. He hears of the job here, and then comes to Vizima. You know, goes east, travels east to get into town. So I thought that was kind of cool. There's that. Get that out of there. Objects of note. Moving on. We didn't have any new people this this uh, part, but um, Geralt's small chest was on the table in the empty chamber, which Geralt was using for his preparations at the beginning of the chapter. The chest was small with metal fittings. Uh, when they say metal fittings in the book, I had to look it up because I just want to make sure that's just the hardware. That's the, the clasps and all that kind of yep. stuff. And had several compartments which held many vials made of dark glass that were packed with dried grass. Cool. Um, Geralt's that potions. Exactly what that looks like in my head, by the way. What? That I know that looks like an Easter basket full of potions. Yeah. Speaking of Geralt's not potions, the not the plastic grass. No, this is the real stuff, the dried stuff. Uh, the dried stuff, the real dry stuff. <laughs> Speaking of Geralt's potions, we got out of his small chest. Geralt pulls out three of many small vials of dark glass, which he then whispers an incantation and drinks two right away. We learn that consuming this allows the Witcher to gain full control of his body and allow him to see in the dark and sharpen his hearing. The side effects are that it makes the drinker's face turn chalk white and their pupils fill their in the entire iris. We also are told that for some who are for someone who is not a Witcher, who had grown who had not grown accustomed to it since childhood, taking a drink would be a lethal poison. So, what are in these potions? In the in the this part, it goes through uh, a couple of ingredients that are in these. So, here are the ingredients to this potion, and some of this info is from Wikipedia. So, we're going to start off with the types of plants that are in this potion. So, he, in the first part, when they describe what's in the potion, they talk about the types of plants, and then they specifically go into the exact plants. So, we'll go. We'll start with the first one. And I'll pull up a little picture here to give you a little example. So we got a uh, veritrum. Veritrum is a genus of a flowering plant. It occurs in damp habitats across much uh, of temperate and subarctic regions. All parts of the plant are poisonous. The effects will occur within 30 to 45 minutes and cause rapid cardiac failure and death if wow. ingested. The Love next it. one is called uh, stramonium. Stramonium. And it kind of kind of looks like a star, and stramonium uh, is a preparation of dried leaves or poisonous seeds with medical and other uses. The plant is a foul-smelling, erect annual, uh, freely branching herb that forms a bush up to 60 to 150 centimeters, or two to five feet tall. It causes hallucinations and can be severely toxic. You were talking about Damn. hallucinogens. Yeah. Okay, see, and I didn't even think that was the one. I thought there was still a different one. But that's to me what it what it represents the most is because of you read a lot of what they were in a lot of tribes that use hallucinations. Uh, hallucin Why do I keep saying that? Yep. Hallucinations. What they used to do is they used to like take somas and then go into battle. And so what it did was it, it let them not be winded. It let them just keep running and not feel the effects of getting you know an arrow in the in the arm or in the leg. They just. Phew, push right through it so to me that's what when when i read that i'm like oh this dude's literally getting high <laughs> yep. and, and again this, the, this uh stramonium and the veritrum these are all types of plants so there's a lot of different plants that have these types of effects um but we're just talking about the types at this point then the next one that he brings up as a type is called hawthorn and hawthorn is a thorny shrub or tree of the rose family with white, pink, or red blossoms and small, dark red fruits called haws. 
hawthorn. The haw berries taste like overripened apples and have great effect in treatment of heart failure. So the first type of plant that we're using in this thing yeah. causes cardiac arrest. The third type of plant we're using helps with heart failure. So it's like it's like mixing everything together that will kind of equal itself out. Obviously, they haven't gotten the the proportions right because it's so potent that it would kill a normal person. But Still, don't try this at home. Don't try this at home, guys. Don't get your hands on He gives or... you the ingredients. Don't make this potion, guys. And the don't last one um, is called spurge. Spurge, <laughs> is a herb... spurge is a herbaceous plant or shrub with milky latex-like sap and very small, typically greenish flowers with unusual and unique floral structures. The sap is a purgative. So a purgative is like um, a I diuretic. It's like a diuretic. Okay. Like it helps okay. you stay. It helps you. Yeah. So okay. if you've, let's Makes say sense. you just put in um, three different types of plants that are either toxic, hallucinogenic, or causes heart failure, you're probably going to want to get that out of your system after it gets in it. You know? So huh. this is what I'm guessing is what the thought behind it is. And then they also say, lastly, and some other ingredients that had no name in any human language. I think that's pretty cool. It's Elvin. It's pretty cool. All right. So then uh, the next uh, object of note, Geralt's Pure Silver Blade. This blade is sheathed in an elaborate hilt with a shiny black scabbard covered in rows, rows of runic signs and symbols. When not in use, he keep his, keeps it thickly wrapped in sheepskin. And I like the fact that it's got signs and symbols on it. I mean, that's just fantasy for you, classic fantasy. But in this world, it seems like I want to know what those runes are because it seems like everything matters in this freaking world. Yeah. Well, thick goat hide. Why he has to wrap that sword up in thick goat hide is because silver is super soft. Oh, I did not know super that. Super soft. So pure silver, a pure silver blade. Like, so the idea of pure silver was always like killing ghosts. Okay. Like the only thing that affects a ghost is silver. I don't, I don't know why that's, you might want to look that up. That's probably another legend. But uh, if you think about it, it's like swinging at air, right? Yeah. So the idea is that you can use a soft sword because you're swinging through the air. It's the same reason he didn't want to fight uh, Bad Manners, dude, with the Thousand Auron, um, because his steel sword would have just cut that sword right in half, just mm. in real life. Even if he went to block or anything, it would just cut right through it. So Or snap it. The thing is, is I don't know how silver would actually work against a real monster or beast. Like, obviously, it's fantasy, so... Right. But that's usually why they had steel daggers, because if the metal is going to be so soft, you have a really fat, wide dagger and make the blade really short. If you have a big, long blade with, of silver, it's just going to snap in half. It must, like, the, because the silver is almost, like, acidic against these monsters and stuff, it must actually, instead of attacking oh, the... Fi- blade. What? The physical. Instead of the physical, it's the spiritual or whatever. Right, yeah. yeah it's, it, it's like attacking yeah. the essence of the being more than the being itself. I don't know. Next object. <laughs> turtle stone. Lord Ostrich. Yeah. Carried... yeah, man. Got to call it the turtle stone. Lord Ostrich carried uh, this on himself when confronting or when he was confronted by the Witcher. He reveals that he has a turtle stone in his possession as a threat before he attacks Geralt. People carry this, carry this thinking it an effective talisman to protect them against dark magic, but they are wrong. <laughs> simply they are wrong and Geralt's no, not going to tell them the secret no all right moving on to flora and fauna we've got some flora and fauna in this one this is when he goes into the details of what uh exactly is in that potion he talks about bane wart monk's hood and eyebright are all the specific plants used in Geralt's potion so starting with uh bane wart it looks like um it looks like a, a regular plant with berries on it, except the berries are dark black. They're kind of like a, like a almost a palish black. Um, they look like blueberries, kind of, but just black. But just black blueberries, you know. And and then the the like the the leaf that's holding the berry up is a, in a star pattern, a five five pointed star pattern, which is kind of cool. The next one is called uh, monk's hood. Monk's hood. Is it- the rule of five is poisonous too, isn't? Wasn't that something we learned in Boy Scouts? I didn't Probably. pay attention during that. I was. I didn't either. I was building birdhouses, right. dog. I didn't want anything to do with poison ivy. Poison oak was rule of five. It may be. 
Um, oh, I, I don't I don't know. I might be talking about my ass. That's okay. We'll the, see. the next real flower that's in there is called monk's hood, and that's just like a tall it's like a tall stalk, almost like a corn stalk, except instead of corn coming off of it, it's these like uh these long elongated flowers that look like a hood, except they're purple, which is kind of cool. And then the last one that they specifically talk about is called a eyebright. Eyebright. And it's just a cool looking white flower with really sharp pointy leaves behind it. It's got a little yellow smile face on the petal. It, it looks pretty cool. And then, um, yeah. So then the next, uh, the next, uh, flora that is in there is the nettles in the courtyard of the abandoned palace. It's overgrown with stinging nettles that Geralt hears Ostrich running through. So nettles are an actual plant, and apparently they're stinging. Kind of probably like, um, oh, what did you you know when you get those spurs stuck on your socks when you're running through the grass? What are those again? You know what I'm talking oh, about? Oh, yeah. The, when we were kids? I don't know the name of them. I can't honestly. remember it either, and everyone's going to be. I can't the name of them, but yeah, the little Velcro balls. Yep. All right, moving on to magic and spells. Geralt whispers an incantation as he sips his potions is this a spell or is this a prayer or is it both? That I wanted to talk to you about this. It's so, an incantation, dog. That it's its own thing. So, but the it's potion both. does the thing. That's my thing. Is like the. I know. I, know. I actually was gonna say it earlier, and then I totally forgot. And it's funny that you brought it up at the end again. Um. Yeah, I, I was gonna say I don't know. Like it wasn't a sign, right? Because right. he didn't make sign with his hands isn't that the thing the that he only has to do? thing that they mention about his hand is he uses his left hand and after each sip he places his hand on his sword so maybe he takes a sip says an incantation Sips. puts Sips. his hand on his sword but so like i was thinking is it like a kind of like a prayer but it's like a prayer of empowerment or something or, or of control and he's trying to like steady himself with his blade or connect himself with his blade or something like as he's as the effects are is what? it a ritual? Yeah, it could be a ritual. Not a, not a spell, because like spells seem to be casted. Yep. And signs seem to be drawn. Yep. He has to draw a sign, right? So he has to do that stupid Inuyasha shit or whatever the hell he's doing. The, what's, what's, wah, 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 and then Naruto. Boom, whatever. Naruto. That's what it is. That's what I was looking for. Um, <laughs> all of a sudden the witcher seems a lot less cool when he's doing gang signs at you yep. and you're like what the hell is he doing all of a sudden bam <laughs> fireball you're like oh that sucked should have probably hid um <laughs> gang sign fireball anyway is that east <laughs> or west side <laughs> either one it's Ooh. north and south um i would say it's more like a ritual that he probably was doing but is that like a bishop blessing his golf clubs kind of ritual just like a just like a give me good luck or is this uh what i ended up settling on is that it was a little bit of both so i was saying is this a spell or a prayer or both but i like how you worded it ritual i didn't think of that word that's exactly kind of what both of those things are where you're you're reciting something like almost like a mantra and it does yep, allow yep. you to focus your energy and maybe he's focusing his energy on the job and he keeps touching the sword to remind himself this is what i'm focusing on i'm focusing on this or whatever you know maybe it awakens his sword somehow i don't know but i kind of i just kind of landed on he's doing the incantation which is doing something but it's either to help calm his nerves or to help post sip is this post sip uh okay we can go back and find out is he tripping balls and then touching that sword is just like making him like grounded. And he's like, all right, just calm down. Well, he hasn't started balls. freaking Stop. out yet at that point because he was just drinking it. And then he wraps himself in his big, um, he wraps himself in his big, here, here it is. Geralt whispered an incantation and drank one after the other, the contents of the two vials, placing his left hand on the blade of the sword after each sip. Then wrapping himself tightly in his black coat, he sat down on the floor. And so, that's when he starts to trip. So he's he's yeah, whispering yeah, the incantation and drink. Like. That's literally what it sounds like. He's like, give me my jacket. I need my jacket. Oh, this is going to be a bad one. I drank two. I drank two. He's got to die before he can be awoken. All right, moving on. Questions for Andre. Uh, this is kind of going back to like the first couple 
parts and it, it comes up again because he his his breath starts to get raspy when he talks his voice is raspy so why is Geralt's voice so unpleasant why do people just hear it as grating was it due to the Marlboro man he could I don't know I guess we're gonna I just want to discuss it was it due to the torture he endured in his training are there witchers who have no vocal issues did he have an accident where a wolf bit his throat like why <laughs> Is his voice so unpleasant? Is drinking the poison... Did drinking yeah. the poison as a kid... It's gotta be. It's gotta be, dude. <laughs> like, is it's it like that well thought out? Is, yeah. Is this book that well thought out? Like, from like five years old, every day you had to drink like six beers and then go chop wood all day. I'm pretty sure by the time you were like 65... Because you remember, he's not a 25-year-old. He's like, not 65. I, also, he's I like think 30. he is. I think he's like thirty. We, I have, we have to bring up the timeline because I really think he doesn't age. I think he's uh, immortal. He's, he's Wolverine. He's okay. Wolverine. We're gonna call him that. But he looks young. But he looks like he's young with gray hair. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I, I, I guess in my mind I thought, now that you know, after speaking with you about it, the fact that they had to drink this this poison that straight up kills people as children and drink it enough yeah. times where they get used to it. Maybe that would cause vocal issues, you know? Can't sing. Maybe that's why he has a bard around him all the time. I, we, I, what bard? Oh yeah, that's right. We haven't got there yet. We'll see. I don't know any bard. Dandelions. Mm, so yeah. Okay. I guess we'll leave it at that. I get the thing that, that surprises me about it is before we move on to part six is was it that well thought out? This is his first story that he wrote. And I, I had posted, I don't know if I posted this question exactly on Reddit or I, I asked this kind of question and someone um, said something to the effect of, well, seeing as this guy wrote, a, you know, seeing as Andre wrote this as a, like a 30 page or 50 page uh, submission for a magazine contest, I don't think it's well that, that well thought out. And I can see what that kid's saying. But at the same yep, time, yep. like, if he no, did think of this. It's not, it's not, okay. I guess the way that I look at it, too, is th th this obviously is translated. We've been over this already, yeah. all right? And the translator, we have to decide if the translator is is better, is the better author than the original author and was just like, I'll take this shitty little short story and turn it into <laughs> this amazing ready-for-TV book, ha <laughs> Okay, I doubt that. I bet you it's the original author and and work closely with the translator to get it, his best idea of what he wanted onto a, another language, right? Or yep. multiple languages. Okay, so because I bet no matter what language it's in, I bet this story is badass. I bet it's pretty close to being the same thing, roughly. Yeah. Okay, um, if not if not more than roughly, I'm trying to say like if not actually pretty close. So. I, I have to believe that it's not that it's necessarily this well thought out. It's just when you put thought and passion and detail and time into something, you end up making mistakes that work. Yes. You end up making mistakes that people who like the story fix the loopholes for you. Yes. Because that's all Star Wars is. If you look at Star Wars, it's all loopholes. Everything is loopholes. Every single thing is a loophole. Palpatine's a clone. Spoiler alert. Little too late. Uh, it's all a loophole, and they have to do it and close it on their on on themselves. Otherwise, you lose the you lose the story. And so, basically, you can talk to any anybody that thinks they're a hardcore fan of Star Wars will tell you all of why. Oh no, that actually works because of this, right? So it's the same thing here. It's like I think you stumble upon accidents that weren't necessarily supposed to be part. I bet you, like him placing his hand on the sword, probably has jack all to do with him taking a sip is just as what he wanted to describe the image he had in his head goes, maybe he's kneeling and has his hand on the sword. So yeah. I'm going to say that. Okay. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you on that. And I think it just so happens to be that we're like, Oh, this is guy's painting a really beautiful picture. This picture came out a lot better than he probably intended it. And even the mistakes have awesome little secrets in them. Yeah. So at worst, if we're going to be realistic, Yep. A raspy voice is just badass for a main character to have, period. Yep. Yep. But at best, we can, as the reader, enjoy it more 
by thinking those are side effects from freaking drinking poison, dog. Don't drink poison, kids. So, uh, that's going to do it for part five. 